Side quests, I would argue, are one of, if not the most important factor in forming an immersive and convincing open world, whether you're talking about an RPG like The Witcher 3 or more of a sandbox such as Skyrim or Fallout 4. And for this reason, I've wanted to, for a while, look into these more specifically and uh, delve into more depth and figure out why I think some are really good and work and are convincing and why others fall flat and I believe they can usually be broken down into two main factors and that is the narrative element and the gameplay element it is for instance the narrative convincing or interesting so much so that it's memorable and intriguing thought-provoking and secondly is the gameplay intriguing enough that it's not just a boring fetch quest or the same shoot whatever now uh, of course these have their own caveats and there's a reason that the trend for fetch quests for instance is so prominent in game development all of which we're going to be discussing as we go through but what we're going to be doing is we're going to be comparing side quests from two games one game i think does side quests really really well and another that i think in general general has its side quests fall flat and I'm of course talking about The Witcher 3 and Fallout 4. Now if you have been following the channel for any period of time you'll have noticed that I talk about these two games a lot but the reason I chose them today specifically was because I think they both offer an example very clear in many cases uh, an example of the two extremes, a side quest which is focused purely on trying to enforce its gameplay cycle and another one that's trying to create interesting and memorable side quests at the expense of more intriguing or consistent gameplay encouragement based on its gameplay cycle. I know all of this sounds like jibber jabber but I swear I'll get into it and explain it in more detail as we go along but I just wanted to provide some context as to why I chose these games. Now, before going on, I want to establish what I mean by side quests just so there's no confusion uh, at all. What I'm referring to when I mention the side quests or a secondary quest as The Witcher 3 puts it, I'm referring to a quest which is completely optional. You can complete the game without finishing this quest. Specifically, what I mean by quest is a task or a mission or some assignment that the game or a character within the game gives you in order to complete for some sort of reward or for whatever. So many many quests especially in Fallout 4 and The Witcher 3 fit into this uh, definition and that's intentional because I don't want to look at the main story because the main story obviously these two teams have very different approaches to their main campaign but the side quests is how we can compare their quote-unquote filler content what they filled up their world with and I don't mean filler in a bad way but rather how they padded the world to try to give it life to try to give it breadth to try to give it some sort of personality which is what we're going to be looking at in detail with our first example so this first quest comes from Fallout 4 and many of you are no doubt familiar with it at this point thanks to many many youtubers including but not limited to Joseph Anderson and the Angry Joe show uh, who referenced this in various critiques or videos that they've done and many people bring it up as a point of reference for how terrible Fallout 4's quests are but I wanted to look through it and see it for myself and there are elements which I actually think makes sense in this quest line other elements which I think don't and so we're going to reference them I actually played through this quest line earlier today in preparation for this video and so all of this footage is fresh latest patch it's all good and here it is so you're running through the wasteland doing your normal thing nothing out of the ordinary and then you hear somebody calling for you from off in the distance it sounds kind of muffled like they're maybe inside of somewhere but you don't think too much of it you can keep running past it and just ignore it and perhaps come back later or you can go and deal with it and investigate what you find when you walk towards it is that the voice is actually coming from a refrigerator that has been blown clear from the house that it clearly came from just about about 15 feet away but there is a pounding in a voice on the inside hollering for help somehow whoever this is heard you coming and is asking for you to help them open the door 
Now, rightfully so, if you're role-playing in Fallout 4, as you are allegedly supposed to do, you would naturally approach this with uh, some amount of skepticism, thinking that maybe it's a raider that's getting ready to pop out or just distracting you to do something like that, which would make sense if Bethesda had done that. However, no, of course, they wouldn't do that. That would make too much sense. Rather, what it is, is once you shut the door or shoot the door off of the fridge, you see that it is a small child that has been turned into a ghoul. But the problem is he doesn't know he's been turned into a ghoul. And even worse, he's been inside since the bombs fell over 200 years ago. Now, this is something a lot of people reference when talking about Bethesda's Fallout games, is they don't seem to understand how long 200 years actually is. If we went back 200 years, we'd be going back before the Civil War ever occurred, before Abraham Lincoln was was even an adult. That's how far back we're going in the just the United States history. In world history, we're going back to the Napoleonic era, just after it, rather. Uh, it's a long, long time ago, and a lot of time passes in between uh, the starting point when the bombs fell and when you are playing. Now, this kid is apparently in a refrigerator next to an open road that's still being actively used by traders and apparently by all sorts of, of uh, raiders and other people. As you see, right as you leave this area, you are approached by a raider. So clearly people travel this area, but in those 200 years, no one has ever stopped to help this kid out of a fridge. Not a, a, No storms have come and knocked it over and the door hasn't popped open. No floods have come along that have buried this thing or washed it down into the ocean. Nothing, nothing. It's still sitting exactly there and the kid hasn't gone insane. The kid uh, hasn't died from starvation or a lack of, of exposure. I don't know what it would be for a ghoul, but it's all just kind of ridiculous. And this naturally causes a lot of people to get pulled right out of it. But Let's give it a chance. So we start talking to the kid. We ask him about where he's from. We ask him what he's doing. Um, and he says he wants to find his parents. You say, well, we can't just go and find your parents because they're probably dead. And apparently you're a horrible person, according to Valentine, for saying this. But you insist and then you try to leave. And you even offer, as I did in this gameplay, I offered to take the kid with me. But no, no. The kid says, no, I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to go with you. I'll, I'll just wait here for my parents or wait to die and get eaten by monsters. I'm offering to take him to see the freaking universe and he's staying here because he's a, a little spoiled brat. So you can leave him there, which I was very tempted to, but I decided to finish the quest out. I went back, offered to take him to his parents' house. He said, okay, started walking and I was approached by a raider. Now this raider offered me 200 caps. I negotiated up to 250 caps uh, in order to sell the boy because they wanted the boy as a slave because he's a ghoul and that would make a good slave because they wouldn't have to worry about feeding or clothing or the radiation or anything like that. He's young, strong, and he's a ghoul. Perfect slave, which makes sense. Some people said that the raider just out of the blue wanted this kid for some reason and perhaps they had a glitch or something that caused that to happen where they didn't have these dialogue options or perhaps this dialogue was added later in a patch in response to these criticisms I'm not sure which I didn't experience this or at least I don't remember it on my first playthrough of Fallout 4 back in 2015 but nonetheless at its current uh, state you talk to the raider, he offers to buy the kid as a slave, which makes sense to me. Um, it's a ghoul, they're viewed as less than people, and so if you were walking down the street, he'd offer to buy him from you. So, I said, okay, yeah, I'll sell him, sold him, then I killed the guy, took the kid to his parents, sure enough, they're happy, they're having a great time, yay, our kid is back, and then I left without talking to the father, because it was so absurd. Oh my god! We thought you were dead! What happened to you? You're all burned up like me. We're ghouls, Billy. Now, this is a clear reference to a side quest that was designed from an initial seed of an idea. Somebody at the office just said, what if we had a side quest where there was a kid that hid in a refrigerator and then the bombs fell uh, or in response to the bombs falling and then he's been turned into a ghoul and he's been stuck in there. 
Now, a, a good game director, he sh would have or should have said, well, okay, yeah, that's a little absurd because it's 200 freaking years. Maybe we do something with the fridge where like, it sounds like a kid's in there, but it turns out it's actually a raider and they're actually like coming and then they jump out of the ruins or out of the house they've been hiding and then they jump on you to try to rob you. That would make sense. That would make sense. But no, no, they stick with it. They don't even filter out the crappy ideas or that initial uh, shred or inkling of an idea. They don't even polish it. They just sit there and say, okay, yeah, whatever. I don't care. And this is the problem is that these ideas all over Fallout 4's side quests lack a polish or a creativity. They have an initial interesting idea, but they don't have that next thing the thing that makes it really interesting or engaging or memorable which we're going to see in this next example from the witcher 3. now everyone knows that the witcher 3 has some of the best writing of any game that's attempted to do the whole open world rpg thing in recent memory it really is pretty incredible when you look at the side quests specifically and there's many reasons why this is partially because they didn't try to write this grandiose main plot with tons of twists and turns but rather they just had this pretty generic plot but let the characters tell their stories and then be the focus rather than the main plot being the focus there's a lot of analysis we could do just on the narrative of the witcher 3 but that's not the point of this video the point of this video is to look at those side quests and why they work so well in communicating the emotion, the personality, the tone of the world that you're playing in. And to demonstrate this, I thought I would point to, at first, this quest that you run into very, very early on in the game. Now, the best way that I can communicate what this quest is about, I think, is to let the game tell you. Essentially, a little backstory, you go to this herbalist shop to ask for some buckthorn to help you track down the local griffin that's been terrorizing everybody, and she's brewing something to try and help this girl that's on the bed behind her. Geralt asks what did it to her, and this is the response. Griffin do that to her? Delina. Yes. Attacked her at night, she was walking in the woods. At night? Through the woods? In wartime? Meeting a boy. The young, you know, do foolish things for love. Wounds are healing, but she will die. Blood's pooling in her skull. Nothing my Bruce can do to help. Could try to help her with one of my potions. Swallow can heal internal hemorrhages. But? Witcher's potions aren't for humans. She'll die as it is. Yes, a peaceful death soothed by your concoctions. If I give her swallow and something goes wrong, the whole village will hear her screams. I understand. Do as you will. And so over the course of that terse exchange, Geralt is faced and he poses this question to the player where the player now can decide whether they want to try and save this girl at the potential cost of a horrendous, painful death, or if they want to just avoid the potential risk, just sit back and uh, let her die a slow, peaceful, calm death. It's all of a sudden this sort of gray question that you have to debate between uh, whether or not you want to risk it or not. It, it's something that's up in the air and everybody's going to decide a little differently and justify it a little differently. I personally chose to give her the swallow and the thing is that the game says that the swallow will take a few days to to take effect and so you go about your business you don't get to see the results of your actions immediately which is something very common throughout the witcher 3 where they'll pose you with some sort of moral dilemma or difficult choice such as this one, but you don't actually get to see the results of your decisions immediately. You'll see them when you're out exploring the world. I've used this example before, 
But without getting too spoilery, essentially in The Witcher 3, there's a a main story mission where this woman is convicted of a horrible crime and she's sentenced to death. And that's that's all you really hear about it. The sentence is basically to be chained to a rock and starve to death and have the buzzards eat her, blah, 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 typical kind of dark stuff. But you go about your business. You keep on playing the game. You kind of forget about it. When I was playing the game, and I've heard other people reference this too, same thing happened. I was on a boat just sailing around, and I saw that woman a good 10 hours in-game later chained to a rock. I saw the little inscription that said, here lies whatever, cursed soul, blah, blah, blah. She was dead. The crows were swirling above her. And that wasn't something that they called attention to, but as you were playing, the world showed that your actions had consequences, that the things that you were witnessing also reverberated throughout the rest of the game world. And I know I sound a little biased here towards The Witcher 3, but it's something that is truly, truly unique. Fallout 4 rewards or punishes you, very rarely punishes you, but if it has some sort of reaction to your decision, it's immediate. If I don't want to go and take Billy, uh, I he just says, okay, well, I'm staying here. Screw you. And he just sits down and, and he stays there and he waits for a monster to come and kill him. There's no like, oh, well, I'll try to find my way over there. And then maybe like in that example, 10 in-game hours later, I go and I find him at that house. He made it. Or maybe 50% of the time he gets mauled and eaten by a, a super legendary super mutant. And yeah, super legendary super mutant. And after I kill the legendary super mutant, I find like an item of Billy's on the dude's person showing that he killed him and took his stuff something like that that's not that hard to do but it shows the difference in thought that went into these quests where the witcher 3 poses these questions to you these decisions that you have to uh debate and eventually uh, resolve to answering in one way or the other And then it shows you the results later in a much more impactful way than just slamming them in your face uh, right off the bat. At least in my opinion. Again, I would like to hear what you think of that down in the comment section below. And yes, you can find out what happened to this girl. Later, you go back to the same herbalist, ask what happened to Lena, and she says that the Nilfgaardians came and took her away. If you go to the camp where actually uh, the Nilfgaardians are stationed, you happen to ride up, you hop off your horse, then you're approached by a Nilfgaardian soldier who asks if you are the guy who was in White Orchard. You're getting ready for some sort of fight. They're probably going to do something. But all of a sudden, you find out that this is the same guy that she had snuck out to be with when she was attacked by the griffin he explains that they took her because her family had cursed her and was gonna uh, do all sorts of things cut out her tongue blah 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 Uh, but she's not the same now she's basically in a coma she doesn't recognize anybody so it's this sort of bittersweet thing she went off with her lover But at the same time, she's not the same person. And there's actually a line by this soldier that I think is really, really intense and sums up this entire quest. And so I'm going to let him say it right now. I don't know whether to thank you or curse you for not letting her die with dignity. Trust me, choice I had to make was harder. And so in one fell swoop, the game destroys your heart, rips it out, and stomps on it in front of you. What a roller coaster ride. And that's just one tiny, tiny quest. And it's something that you don't really seek or trace as you go through. Now, the idea of curiosity is something which I also wanted to address in this video. I think it's incredibly important with regards to side quests and questing in general. Games that focus on rewards rewarding curiosity and exploration, especially when that seems to be their main tenant. Now, this is something that uh, I will give Bethesda credit for. They tend to reward curiosity in the form of really 
interesting environmental uh, storytelling. You know, you walk in on a diner and you see all these corpses. You see, uh, you know, two people fighting or you walk into this burned down house and you see two skeletons holding hands because this elderly couple wanted to die in peace together. So when the bombs fell, they just laid down and took it. That's really, really beautiful and still deep and sad and memorable right then and there. Uh, With Breath of the Wild, uh, exploration and curiosity is rewarded in basically every element. I, I can't really explain it without going into a whole nother video on Breath of the Wild, but if you've played the game, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And with uh, this example of The Witcher 3, you do a quest like this, where after you give the the herbalist the potion, it's just kind of like, okay, quest completed, and you go about your business. And it's not until 20 hours later when you're just riding through the world doing your thing, when you're like, oh, I need to stop at this herbalist herbalist shop and get something. You walk in, you see it's the same lady, and you see that you can ask about the girl. You ask about the girl. She mentions that Nilfgaardians took her. Okay, um, that's too bad. And you assume maybe they just kidnapped her, or maybe her lover came and took her, something like that. You go by your business, and then 10 hours later, you enter this camp, and all of a sudden, um, it's addressed, and you're like, oh my gosh, I had forgotten about her. I completely moved on, but okay, that's really sad to think that that decision I made made in real world terms weeks or months ago in terms of how fast you play the game is still uh, has it still has long lasting effects that's the type of game that the witcher 3 is and that's why its side quests are so memorable because as you explore the world as you're doing other quests as you're doing other tasks for other people it's still brought up and your decisions have lasting consequences. In Fallout 4 and other games, it's very, very rare to run into those instances where you actually have decisions that have long lasting effects that you see as you go through the world. If something happens, it happens right then and there and that's it. It's never mentioned again because to account for it would be crazy complicated and difficult. CD Projekt Red says, oh yeah, crazy, difficult, and complicated bring it on that's our forte and that's one of the key differences between cd project red's approach to side questing and a company like bethesda's and of course these are just two quests in massive hundreds of hours worth of content rpgs like these are very very large games and i only pulled two quests out of it so far to demonstrate these points but there's many many others if you look at just fallout 4 or just skyrim i could think off the dome of the, a, a huge number of these quests that are purely fetch quests not even just the preston garvey we have a settlement that needs your help quests which are uh, quote unquote procedurally or dynamically, as Bethesda puts it, generated, so they never technically run out. There will always be more, which is, again, going back to the idea of quantity over quality. And of course, there's quests like that. There's the beast hunting quests. There's treasure hunts and things like that in The Witcher 3. But it can't really be denied that an approach to narrative and lasting memorability was given higher priority on CD Projekt Red side than on Bethesda's. And that's uh, not necessarily a bad thing for all players. For me and for a lot of people in my audience, it's preferable to have more narrative uh, behind it, less plot holes, so to speak. Now, going back to the thing I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there are all of these quests in Fallout 4 that are trying to encourage you to Go back to the gameplay loop that is established and that is carried through the entire game, which is essentially to go find stuff, to kill stuff, and then maybe work on your base. That's what Fallout 4 is about. Whereas The Witcher 3's gameplay loop is to certainly find and kill stuff, but also to engage and to make these long-lasting and affecting uh, changes to the world around you. And the quests reflect that uh, all throughout the game from your first hour to your 900th hour. It's all built on encouraging the gameplay loop that is established very early on. It's something that's very, very common in these open world games. 
And this is why I keep saying, in my opinion, and I keep saying that it's it's dependent on what you think of the game or on how much you like these games or what you look for in an open world game, because it will be different. Some people, like my little brothers, for instance, honestly love Fallout 4's focus on shooting because they play it as an open world action shooter rather than trying to play it as a narrative RPG, as you should if you're going to play Fallout 4. Whereas when you play The Witcher 3, you have to be much more patient. You have to go through, listen to these people's stories, and be willing to fully immerse yourself in this world. And so it offers different things to different people. It's not to say that one is necessarily better than the other in terms of play style, but that they cater to different audiences. And the side quests that these games uh, are built off of, I think, also reflect this different difference in play style and this difference in overall philosophy to the grander uh, meta structure of the game itself. Now, as for the big question, the big mama jamba, which game do I think has the better side quests? I would say, in my humble opinion, that The Witcher 3 has better side quests and better quests objectively and subjectively. So what I mean by that is that subjectively, I prefer The Witcher 3's side quests. I prefer the more narrative structure, their approach at memorability, uh, memorability and, and this long-lasting effect, how I can remember Lena's name even though I played that side quest and it took me 10 minutes in my first hour and a half of playing the game out of the hundreds of hours in total I've put into The Witcher 3, I can still remember her name, whereas I had to really struggle to remember Billy's name from the Fallout 4 bit. So it's just a small difference, but I personally enjoy that approach more. I also enjoy the diversity of uh, the tasks that they give you with the Witcher senses, having these sort of detective-esque missions, these other missions where you have to convince people you have to talk or maybe you have to go and you put on a play in one quest and you do on all of these little things that are so different and so varying. It's wonderful. I subjectively, I prefer that. In terms of object, objectivity, I think that The Witcher 3 would still win, again, because it offers a stronger narrative basis behind it, which doesn't come as a surprise. The Fallout 4 uh, supporters in our midst would argue that the shooting or the gameplay element is way better than The Witcher 3's, which for them personally, subjectively, that might be true, but in an object sense, it isn't true because the gameplay is very one dimensional. It always goes back to enforcing that gameplay loop that we established early on this shooting hunt kill, uh, retrieve. That's basically all you do in fallout four. Now you do those things in the Witcher three, certainly, but you also do a lot of other things. You go and you you go hunting, and then you also go and you use your Witcher senses to play detective. And then you go also go and you have to talk to people, and you have meaningful dialogue choices that can impact it. And then other quests, you know, you go and you you put on a show, and then other quests, you go and you hunt down this monster that turns out to be a long lost lover of who I, it's offers a wide variety of these things, and it's all interlinked objectively. The Witcher 3 has a much broader range of things available to you uh, in terms of tasks to be completed. Fallout 4 says, listen, we're going to be a shooter. We're going to offer you stuff to shoot at, and we're going to give you stuff to shoot at those things with. And they do that for 40, 50, 60 hours, depending on how long you play. And if you enjoy that, you will have a great time. Whereas if you're looking for a broader experience that takes more patience, certainly The Witcher 3 offers a better experience because they approach it in a much different way, which hopefully I've semi-explained over the course of the last half hour. But that's all for this video. If you liked it, please hit the thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. And if you're willing to support me on Patreon, I would be eternally grateful. After all, I am a broke college student and anything helps. But with all that, thank you for watching. I love you all. Peace out.